Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnerships Annual Event 2021. I'm Howard Bentham, and I'm your host for the next hour or so as we take a business-focused look back over our shoulders at the last 12 months, celebrating the many successes that organisations and companies in the county have achieved with support from Oxlep, as well as projecting forward into the coming year, outlining our continued commitment to supporting the Oxfordshire economy, especially important with these challenging times we continue to find ourselves in. I remember signing off from the broadcast during last year's Oxlep annual event, suggesting we would be back together face to face in a COVID free world, perhaps enjoying a coffee and a croissant in a venue like the Plavatnik, all suited and booted as we were before. Sadly, my mystic and psychic abilities were well off beam. And here we all are with the COVID headlines seemingly getting worse, still needing to meet remotely. I'll make sure that I make no further future predictions and leave those to our expert panel who will meet shortly. During this annual event, we want to demonstrate the role Oxlet play in helping to create favourable economic conditions here in Oxfordshire, supporting sustainable and dynamic growth. We want to demonstrate the role Oxlet play in elevating Oxfordshire's innovation-led economy, as well as creating a forum for discussion with Oxlet representatives. With discussion very much in mind, please feel free to post your comments and questions to our panel throughout this presentation. There's a questions tab on this platform where you can post your points. So let's make this as interactive as possible and we'll put as many of your questions to our panelists in a Q&A at the end of the broadcast. And if you're watching this as a recording, please get in touch via the website at oxfordshirelep.com. There's been, this has been another unprecedented year with businesses having to continue to be agile and adaptable. The difficulties generated by the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the UK's departure from the European Union have come into sharp focus over the last 12 months. We'll talk about some of the key areas of difficulty locally, nationally and globally with our panel very soon. We want to really grasp this opportunity though to stress the role Oxlep have played in supporting our business community to be the best they can be and how they can help your organization in the future. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've engaged with over 2,600 Oxfordshire businesses, provided over 12,000 hours of business support and launched and committed two million pounds plus of funding via our business investment fund. We've also administered in excess of five million pounds worth of direct funding into businesses across multiple sectors. Over 800 businesses in the county were also supported with Brexit specific advice. During this session, we'll delve into the detail of this and find out how we've continued that unwavering support for our business community, as well as how we've secured and helped leverage further investment for the county's key economic priorities. Also in the next hour, we want to show how we've continued to help nurture a world-class innovation ecosystem that led the global response to the pandemic through the development of the Oxford vaccine, as well as championing the role Oxfordshire has to play in driving forward a zero carbon future for the planet. Oxfordshire punches far above its weight economically for the size of place that it is, and it's a real magnet to the many people who see their future in the county's exciting, high-tech, cutting-edge businesses that are, put simply, shaping our future in every conceivable way. Oxfordshire is a place of opportunity. There's certainly a lot of wow in the county, as this short film demonstrates. This is no ordinary door. Behind it lies a world of infinite possibilities. It's here where we discovered penicillin, lithium ion batteries, and where Riz Ahmed came to study. And it's where you could find your future, in Oxfordshire. Come on then. It's here that ideas are developed which have helped shape our society. And people here are still working on transforming our future, pushing the boundaries in fusion, autonomous vehicles, space travel and more. 
As an Oxford graduate, your degree will open doors to the most exciting and important career opportunities in the 21st century. So, let's see what's on your doorstep. Many of the toughest challenges facing humanity are being tackled right here. From life sciences and education, to reducing our impact on the planet, from construction to cryogenics. This is Oxford Science Park. Now, I thought that working in science would be spent peering through a microscope. And yeah, there's some of that. But look at this place. You could be part of this but it's just one of many career opportunities for anyone who wants to change the world. Perhaps you want to play a part in our country's journey to zero carbon and future-proof your career. In Oxfordshire, they're leading the green revolution in construction, building zero carbon homes to combat climate change, a perfect place to put down roots. And if you're looking for answers up there, there are opportunities opening up right here. The UK is planning to quadruple its activity in the space sector by 2030 and companies like Oxford Space Systems and Catapult are aiming to capture a 10% share of global satellite applications. Then there's Rebellion, one of Europe's largest independent media companies, designing games, publishing books and comics and making films and TV. This is where digital skills are transforming entertainment. Media, communications, publishing, the arts and preserving our cultural heritage are all vital to the economy and an important part of what makes Oxfordshire special. Let's talk to some graduates about their decision to work in Oxfordshire. Hello, uh, I'm Manisha Kushwaha and I got the opportunity to work at Oxford Space System right after my education. I live in a very small village, um, but I love it. Uh, that's what I like. But uh, still we are accessible. Uh, there's plenty of buses to Oxford, trains to London, and it's just an hour away from the beach. My name's Paul Farrow. Um, I studied at the Department of Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Oxford. Finished my PhD and found a fantastic company. The company's grown from about 20 people when I started to now having a global presence of over 400. So it's a fantastic decision to stay in the area. Oxfordshire has one of the most skilled workforces in the country, so you'll fit right in. Maybe at one of the nine technology and business parks, like this one, Harwell, the UK's leading science, innovation and technology campus, with 200 organisations employing over 6,000 people. For graduates wanting a career in healthcare and life sciences, Oxford University Hospitals is a world-famous centre of excellence. They partner with the University of Oxford to bring innovation from the laboratory bench to the bedside. And if you don't want to leave uni life, the universities themselves employ over 18,000 people between them. Oxfordshire is growing, which means there are all sorts of opportunities for graduates to get a start. Whatever your degree, Whatever you want to do, Oxfordshire is a fantastic place to live, where you can join people who are transforming our future. So, whatever door you choose, the keys to your future await you right here. So let's meet our panel for the Oxlep annual event 2021. Nigel Tipple is the inspirational leader of Oxlep, who has truly driven the local enterprise partnership to genuine heights. Prior to the pandemic, he was assisting Oxfordshire's businesses into a period of exceptional growth. However, like all of the business community, his focus currently is getting Oxfordshire ahead of where we were pre-COVID and with the lessons learned from the last two years, helping put these into practice around the county. Managing change and regrowth is in Nigel's DNA. He's led the way in regenerating various parts of the country in his career to date. Two years at Renaissance South Yorkshire and six years as chief executive at Regenerating Cornwall are to his credit, including being a trustee of Bike Cornwall, promoting cycling and healthy lifestyles. He's also a director of the Oxfordshire Business Awards, Savvy Limited, which is a management consultancy offering support to public, private and third sector organisations and a non-executive director of VentureFest, which they proudly boast is the business creation networking event of the year. 
And also with us is Jeremy Long. Jeremy has been in post as the chair of Oxlep for nearly six years, bringing a wealth of experience from his working career, leading world-class organizations in both the UK and abroad. He was until recently the CEO for Europe of the Hong Kong headquartered international railway and property group, MTR Corporation, where he spent 15 very successful years. Jeremy is a graduate of the University of Oxford, and since stepping away from his role with MTR, has taken on the non-executive director role at the transportation company CDPQ in Montreal in Canada and others. Welcome to you both. Jeremy, if we can start with you, let's uh, first take stock with a, a bit of a review of 2021 and Oxlep's role in championing local businesses and organizations. From your perspective, what were the biggest challenges businesses were facing? Morning, Howard, and good morning, everyone. Well, I think it's sometimes difficult to look that far back now, but I think we all know when it first came upon us, it was the safety of our own employees. Uh, many of us found having to adapt our own practices to make sure that our own employees could carry on in many cases working. In other cases, obviously pivot to home working. I think next was each of us having to look at our customer base and what it meant for us in terms of how we could go on selling and marketing our businesses. Then I think many of us found problems in our supply chain and fundamentally the effects on our cash flow. And uh, Nigel, I mean, what sort of conversations were, were business leaders having with you during the last 12 months? What were the hot topics of conversation? Excellent, Howard, can you hear me now? It just, yes, we can um, hear you. There's a bit of a delay on the unmuting. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, in terms of business challenges, um, clearly as we moved it into and through COVID, there were a myriad of, uh, of opportunities for business to ac access support. And I think the challenge for many was, was to kind of triage it, understanding how to move between those different areas of support. But I think if I was to look specifically at, at two or three areas, one was that clarity. Um, really needing to understand where the support was and how to access it. And that's certainly where we as an organization stepped into that territory to help um, navigate and to help point people in the right direction. There's been a continued pressure around labor and labor shortages, in particularly in key areas. And we've seen very significant impact in visitor economy, food and tourism, for instance, but across a much wider footprint. Um, so again, those have been some challenges. And as we're moving through COVID now, staff retention um, is a critical aspect for, for most businesses. And Jeremy touched on it uh, just then. Of course, access to finance, whether that was to provide working capital to enable those businesses to, to transition and to continue. And in many cases, growth. So I think, you know, if we're looking at the support that was available and look deeper into that kind of response then growing and positioning a, a customer base has been key. Building on, and in some cases, developing their R&D capability and communicating, making sure that they can communicate to a wider business audience, to their customers, and to collaborate with many of the businesses who are, found themselves in a similar position, but creating new opportunities in the marketplace. So some real challenges, but I think our businesses have responded. And Jeremy, we talk about businesses having to be agile and adaptable in the current climate. How has uh, Oxlep's work had to pivot in the last 12 months, not, not least in just ha how things are day to day, but also the, the offer from the organisation? Well, as, as, as Nigel just referred to, um, we've uh, stepped up our activity in the short term to support, to uh, respond to government's programs that were made available and to respond really quickly uh, with our local authorities to provide grants, loans, uh, business support to businesses. Um, we've become a virtual organization ourselves. Uh, we already were to a certain extent, but like many organizations, um, we, we actually moved our head office. Any of us have barely been in the head office uh, since. Uh, we've stepped up the, uh, the level of, of web virtual activity very considerably. Um, and, and made ourselves as available as possible, as, as Nigel said, um, for many, many businesses who are having to face in really short order uh, challenges that they just never expected to encounter. And, and that ability to work smarter re really is, a, is quite a message and, and, and something we, we've been able to sort of uh, help, help others with, Jeremy. 
Yeah, very much so. And I said we've, you know, we've we've stepped up the rate of uh, support in our growth hub. Um, we were able to work with the local authorities to um, <clears throat> to vet and scrutinise the uh, applications that there were for uh, businesses in distress from a cash point of view, and provide the support, help them when the early stages of the furlough scheme, for example, were announced. It was about getting businesses to understand what was available to them and help them to make the right decisions about their own workforce. Nigel, there have been some brilliant projects, schemes and funds that Oxlep have helped come to fruition in 2021. Let's take a look at a few specifically. Tell us about the success of the Business Investment Fund. Yeah, absolutely. So the Business Investment Fund was developed through what was the getting uh, building fund that government launched. Uh, and we were looking at how we could maximize the availability of support to businesses over and above that which we already delivered through our growth hub, through our skills hub and through our internationalization work. So we have existing programs like the Innovation Support for Business program and the Escalate. But many of our businesses are small and medium sized enterprises. You know, we're looking at 95% plus of our, our business base is, is SME. Um, and therefore, we needed to be able to respond in a, in a different way to help them to think about their business, to navigate that business journey, to look at new business opportunities. And, and during that period, you touched on it earlier in your introduction, you know, over 2,600 businesses that we've engaged with over that period of time. Um, actually, over 1,500 of those businesses have been using the online triage kit, the ability to, to self-analyze, to identify some of those challenges, and for us to then help them to navigate that journey. So it's often easier to have that engaged conversation. We use the platform of technology to help create the connection, but then follow that up through, um, you know, through different media and through different opportunities. Um, and, I, you know, there have also been grants awarded through that business uh, investment fund. Um, so to support businesses to, to pivot, you know, that new word that came into our lexicon over, over the period of COVID, that ability to change direction, to use existing services, to find ways of selling product into market that were different or to collaborate in a different way. Um, and we also, over that period, we must remember we're dealing with the exit from the European Union. We were managing a series of, uh, of both pandemic and EU exit challenges, again, over 420 businesses with specific engagement to support them around that EU transition, um, and over 190 that we did some detailed uh, business planning with, really detailed work to help them navigate their, their new business opportunities. So it created a momentum, created capacity, allowed us to think a little bit more creatively about how we can support businesses with a blend of one-to-one -one support, mentoring, we also linked it with our skills agenda as well, looking at the skills and the future skills needed in those businesses. So really important program. And, and BIF itself, you know, 2.2 million pounds worth of investment. Um, that that was delivered as a series of grants, um, you know, 30 plus uh, grants going into businesses matched uh, in many cases pound for pound. And two or three of those tap social, um, you know, local social enterprise to help them diversify uh, their, their offer. So beyond the, the, the kind of traditional brewery element, but into food and drink more widely. Lentus Composites, one of the uh, Polar Group engineering uh, firms who again look to accelerate their R&D program over that period of time. Um, and that's allowed them to identify new markets and to respond to new challenges. And also another company there, Zeta Specialist Lighting, um, who moved into um, electric vehicle charging systems and have worked very successfully with our local authorities on their program called Park and Charge. But specifically in this case, it was looking at how can you support um, you know, the domestic market? How can you support people with charging capability within their home? So that's just two or three examples there of a social enterprise, of an engineering company and a technology company looking to utilize that business investment fund to accelerate their, their journey through COVID to identify new markets and create capacity. Great stuff. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. You're watching the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership's annual event 2021. Uh, really appreciate you being here. And thanks for all the comments that you've posted in the questions tab on this platform so far. We'll be having a dedicated Q&A towards the end of the broadcast. 
where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. Please feel free to keep posting your comments, questions and reactions to our panel. If you're watching this as a recording, then you can get in touch with the team via the website at oxfordshirelep.com. Jeremy, let's delve into the detail of some of the other projects to really hit the ground running during the last 12 months where Oxlip have secured critical funding. Give us the lowdown on the Wood Centre for Innovation. I know that you attended its uh, additional lab space official opening that was back in the summer. How critical is this type of investment, particularly for the sector like life sciences in Oxfordshire? Well, for those that may not know the Wood Centre, it's a, a really admirable organisation. I think it was started 40, 50 years ago by uh, Sir Martin Wood and his wife, who were the founders of Oxford Instruments. And uh, one of their legacies was to found this centre, which is a combination of science space and science education space. So uh, on the one hand, it brings young kids in to really experience science firsthand and to experiment, play with uh, science. On the other, it's a very serious part of uh, offering wet lab space, incubator space to young businesses, some of those that we even heard in the first video. Spin-outs who are looking for the very first small amount of space, and in some cases shared space, because they can't afford to have all the facilities themselves. And we got behind as Oxlet to part fund a further expansion of the space, and indeed we are about to part fund a further expansion, and such has been the demand as soon as it opened, uh, the centre was uh, fully let, and I said with with other would-be tenants waiting. And it's just an example of the demand that there is for little businesses with their own idea, their own would-be patent in the making, uh, to look for the basis on which they can grow and nurture their idea or their their product. Great stuff. The meanwhile in Oxfordshire programme, Nigel, is looking to repurpose buildings in our changing city and town centres, isn't it? It is indeed, and, and again, it was an example of working with a wider partnership, looking at some of the challenges through COVID, particularly in this case on our high streets. And we've all seen, sadly, businesses who've not been able to to make that transition over that period of time. And yeah, you know, one of the, the the saddest things for me is walking around a town centre with empty shop fronts, um, and particularly when it's in your community. So. What we did was mobilise through the uh, the business in uh, um, the Getting Building Fund, alongside some of the other initiatives, the business support and skills initiatives, to work with our local authority partners, led initially by the City Council in Oxford, working with MakeSpace, to develop a programme of uh, premises refurbishment. So that's a just short £2 million investment, bringing back something in the order of 20,000 square feet plus of what would have been empty retail space uh, as a pilot scheme within town centres to really invigorate, to bring together the challenges of, you know, how are you as a, a small business perhaps going to be able to make that step into a into a retail premises? Quite often the challenge is head lease and covenant strength for those who understand that the ability to pay the rent. And um, what we've done is stepped between the two. We've created a programme that brings together the, the vacant space, the opportunity for landlords to be able to let that on a short term basis and improve their cash flow and create an opportunity for businesses who perhaps always wanted to move into high street, to move into there in a, a cost effective way. They, they pay their rent, but but we've actually taken some of the pain of the negotiation of, of the head lease out. And that's where MakeSpace, working with our local authority partners, has made a real difference. And that's aligned then with how we support them as businesses. So looking at their business planning, looking at their, their markets and opportunities to expand their markets, and importantly, collaboration. And if you think a couple of really kind of live examples where you might have businesses who were trading out of their, you know, out their front room, out of their garden shed at the end uh, of the garden or out of a garage space, and we can move them into a retail premises, sometimes more than one into a retail unit, and suddenly you create a, a venue, a place, a space, where they can do business, the high street comes back to life and you create a real buzz around those those kinds of initiatives. So to pilot, we want to do more, but that two million pounds has been well spent on reinvigorating a series of, uh, of retail units across both the city and, and our urban centres. Another success story, Nigel, you're also at the opening of the Activate Hospitality Suite. Tell us about this initiative, clearly an important yeah. investment for a sector that's been so badly hit by the pandemic. 
Yeah, clearly, I, I mean, it, it, it's both opportunistic in the sense of, uh, of, of responding to the pandemic, but this was planned pre-pandemic. So we've been working with Activate um, on this particular project for a couple of years now, uh, prior to, uh, to COVID. Um, and the opportunity was to look at how we could enhance the quality of the environment that our young people were experiencing to be more like a work environment. So a high quality uh, space that you would expect to see in any, uh, any food or, or, or retail premise, food retail premises. Um, we invested again just over two million pounds uh, alongside Activate's investment. So it was a three million pound investment in state of the art facilities to both train, but train in a real world situation. And, and the real uh, value of this is that those, those young people who are going through that training get the sense of having to work in that, that speed and pace of a, of a commercial kitchen um, and activate through their commercial partners. So the, the, the fact that group, Heston Blumenthal's uh, uh, group, um, they've, they've come together. So you've got sharp end commercial innovative uh, food and retail sector working with academia supported by us as, as a business-led organization to create an environment where we build the futures for those young people and for those businesses now looking to recruit we know that's a challenge um, there's a pipeline starting to come through there of, of talented new um, chefs those who who want to to go into that um, career path uh, and indeed wider, you know, front of house and other other retail uh, opportunities. So really important investment. Great stuff, great story. Uh, Jeremy, in the, in the last year, Oxlep has also secured critical funding for the development of the Green Construction Skills Centre at Abingdon and Whitney College. Presumably this type of funding helping to ensure uh, we have the right skills available to, su to support sustainable construction in Oxfordshire is a major step in the right direction. Yes, I mean, this is another example of where we were happy to support uh, another of our FE college establishments um, to be able to increase their capacity, but particularly so in a field like the green construction skills where we know there is huge demand and there will be uh, even greater demand. The traditional skills of plumbing and electrical work are having to evolve in some areas to the installation of PV, the installation of heat pumps and so on, that requires different training. It's also a really exciting field, and it's again a part of them, and we'll come on to it later, I know, but where we want to encourage youngsters to see a different career path uh, in, in, in industries that they might have regarded as being somewhat dated, but in fact have got really exciting opportunities. And before we move the conversation on, Jeremy, let, let's just reflect upon and, and recognise the global capabilities of the economy that Oxlep champion. This includes the major ability in Oxfordshire to harness new technologies that can support a zero carbon future globally, uh, as demonstrated through our COP26 event and the launch of the Pathways to a Zero Carbon Oxfordshire report. Share your thoughts. Yes, I mean, we, we, we focused already this morning on a lot of the tactical things we've been doing to do our utmost to support businesses in the short term in terms of the difficulties we've been going through. But we've remained also a strategic organisation as we're expected to be. And so we have continued to look at, from an international point of view, how we work with the Department of International Trade to encourage talent and businesses to come here, some of the very things we saw in the introductory video. Uh, we've, we've, as you've just referred to, Howard, we've also done a lot of work strategically to bring partners together to look at the energy future uh, for not just for this county, uh, but for the nation. So we, we've, we've not lost sight of the longer term aims of continuing to make Oxford and Oxfordshire a more prosperous place to, to come and live and work. And Nigel, uh, just before we uh, uh, watch another short film, give us your perspective on this amazing, it's a gift, isn't it, that Oxfordshire clearly has uh, and its ability to be front and centre in solving global problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we've seen some very significant um, responses through that innovation system, through that, that kind of business creativity over the period of COVID. Um, but we've also seen, um, you know, through that, not just the vaccine response, but, you know, prior to that, we had, or during that same period, where the, the, the work around ventilators, where we saw the engineering sector, particularly automotive sector, pivot very quickly. Um, but we've also seen businesses 
come to life in a different way. That that real social value perspective and, and caring about the communities that they live in and the people that importantly populate those communities. Uh, and we've rediscovered many of those connections back to community. So we've got a rich research and development uh, technology capability across Oxfordshire, whether that's space and satellite, whether it's uh, you know advanced engineering, manufacturing, uh, work around autonomous vehicles. We can we can roll those off off the tongue in in many ways, and they are globally significant technologies. But we've also been able to take our communities with us, and I think that's been the important aspect over over COVID. Many of our businesses are touched on our SMEs. They they employ local people within their local communities, and allowing them, as we saw in the earlier video, to be able to realise their potential to access some of the, the jobs that perhaps previously they thought they might have to move away from the county to achieve, uh, has been a really significant boost. Um, we mustn't be complacent that that research and development rich technology will continue to evolve, but we have to take our communities with us. So the evolution of how we support our skills agenda, our business support agenda is as important as the technology and the capability that, that we really do benefit from. Um, and it is globally leading, not just globally significant. Um, so yeah, really important um, projects around fusion coming up, energy resilience, things like that, that we're, that we're looking to support. So really important that we continue to promote that. And Jeremy's touched on some of the renewable technologies. You know, companies like um, Oxford PV leading the world in, in the development of new um, solar panels. So really significant opportunities. Great stuff. Uh, we'll continue to hear the thoughts of both Jeremy Long and Nigel Tipple from Oxlep on what 2022 holds in just a few moments. But let's focus on the support that the Oxfordshire Local Enterprise Partnership offers businesses and organisations in the county, providing invaluable advice, access to funding, creating collaborative communities and an arm round the shoulder that many need at this critical time. Today we're here for our third marketplace event. The aim of today is to bring together clients that we've been working with uh, over the last 18 months during the pandemic, just to get them talking to each other and find out more about what's available in Oxfordshire. Today I'm exhibiting my 3D printing company. It's been really, really good. There's been a lot of leads coming in, lots of interesting conversations. I've just started out a new company. Oxlab has been wonderful in helping me we start the business in the UK. We run a business offering green energy solutions. This has probably been the best event so far in a while that we've had. We're delighted to be able to get back to face-to-face -to -face business engagement following the pandemic. This is the first kind of real uh, event since lockdown. Tremendous response in terms of people wanting to come out and start that networking and start really proactively engaging in where they want to go as a business. It's really great to be at an in-person event, finally. And it's been really good to get back out there and actually meet people rather than seeing small squares on a screen. The last 18 months, as we know, has been difficult for lots of organisations, but I'm really proud to be able to say that we've been able to support over 2,500 businesses over the last 18 months through a series of uh, workshops, webinars, one-to-one -one support and grant schemes. We've had uh, quite a lot of help from Oxlap actually, we've done one-to-one -one sessions with business advisors. We've had a few grants, the grants have been an absolute lifeline for us to come out of the pandemic in a stronger position. Moving forward we're going to be offering one-to-one -one support, webinars, grant schemes, so if you want to get in touch please do and we can talk you through what's available to support you in the months coming forward. Thank you for the host of questions and comments coming from you for our panellists. If you want to add to the discussion, there is a questions tab on this platform where you can post your points. We'll try and make this as interactive as possible and put as many of your questions as we can to our panellists in a Q&A in around about 20 minutes time. 
If you're watching this on catch up as a recording, you can get in touch via the website at OxfordshireLEP.com. Oxlep's chair is Jeremy Long and the chief executive is Nigel Tipple. Let's look ahead now to 2022 and the challenges that businesses face in Oxfordshire and how Oxlep can play such a vital part in supporting organisations every step of the way. Jeremy, we were talking earlier how agile and adaptable Oxlep has had to be in the current climate. How can businesses help themselves be ready to react as best they can to such uncertain times with the headlines seemingly going in the wrong direction at the moment? Well, let me say, let's just hope uh, that is not the case, although none of us quite know at the moment. But I think as, as, as Nigel touched on a few minutes ago, I think for many businesses, it's been a really tough period, but also one where maybe they've got to know their businesses a bit better than they, they ever have done before, whether as Nigel said, it's their local community or in some ways actually understanding their markets. I mean, we know many businesses that really had to think about what their product was, what service they were offering and figure out how else to be able to maybe to continue to market that or indeed market it to, to new in completely new directions. And I think that will remain the case. I think as markets open up again, we will see some businesses who will actually have been able to move forward faster than they had they had previously thought was possible. Um, we're helping businesses uh, to find new export markets where we can. We're helping obviously businesses to find new ways, uh, new ways of directing what they might have thought previously was a single source of uh, product for them into, into new areas. And the resilience that I think, again, um, another word that we've all come to, to use more often than we felt we had to previously, to find ways of uh, one's own business being more resilient at different levels of activity. Many businesses have had to, to scale down, partially scale down, in some cases close completely, and figure out for them what survival means or running at half uh, pace and be able to gear up again. So they've learned um, processes uh, which will make them more adaptable in the future if that need sadly does arise. Nigel, what practical help is there in place from Oxlep currently, or perhaps in the pipeline, to enable businesses, as, as Jeremy's just alluded to, to be fleet of foot when they need to adapt? Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, we've touched on several times the, the the breadth of business support that's available, but that's um, sometimes easy easy to say and 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 difficult to navigate. And I, I touched on it earlier. We have the capability through our growth hub, through our business support team, to be able to have those conversations on a one to one basis with businesses to better understand some of the challenges. That are always unique to that business. You know, there may be a there may be a common thread in there, but the particular challenges are unique to individual businesses. Um, and the team of advisors, the work that we do through peer networks, through the mentoring uh, opportunities that we have, the diagnostic toolkit that I referred to earlier begins to help people to identify some of the challenges. So it could be new markets. It could be looking at yeah, we touched on the example of the business investment uh, fund grant to tap social earlier. Uh, that was about them looking at you know their way of moving forward and their their principles around the you know social enterprise and, and supporting communities. But they're also a business. If they're not a business, then they can't operate, they can't trade, and they were looking at new markets. So they they moved into you know bakery and a whole range of other things. But that was about how do we help them navigate that journey? So what do they need? How do we support them? In that case, a grant helped them. In others, it's been a case of identifying new markets or as part of that new market development, building collaborations either within the UK to improve their capability and capacity to scale up um, or indeed looking at new markets. And as the trade deals start to come through, our internationalization and investment work, working with Department for International Trade, has been gearing up to look at the opportunities to promote our businesses, our capability to a global marketplace. Um, you know, we've recently launched some fusion, uh, some work around fusion, high performance opportunities that's looking at global markets. But equally, we're working with small businesses to identify domestic market opportunities where they might be in that position of changing a product or service to meet a new demand. Um, and for many, COVID created new opportunities they weren't expecting, new markets, new marketplace, and very much new collaborations. The other element is skills. Um, our skills team working with, again, employers, working with schools and colleges 
to identify the future skills needs for those businesses to help inform the way that our colleges and our schools can, can teach uh, and to create the right kind of training programs. But importantly, businesses going into schools and creating the connection so that young people can see where they can work, what the opportunities are. And we also have a very strong apprenticeship program where we're looking to work through and with businesses to create those opportunities, but using the young people as ambassadors. It's far easier for them to motivate fellow young people, you know, coming through school who they can recognize, who they can see as a, as a kind of peer group uh, in order to motivate them. And, that, and that's across a wide range of technologies and capabilities. So real opportunity to, uh, to accelerate the support that's available, use our website, use our, our connections through our growth hub, our skills and our internationalization work. And we would encourage any business, large or small, just to, you know, to engage with us. Um, we, we can route people to new opportunities, we can signpost to all the supports available, and Jeremy touched on it earlier, that, that kind of triage role, that ability to navigate between the funds, between the opportunities and direct business. Running an environmentally sustainable business, Jeremy, uh, is only going to become increasingly important. What role can Oxlet play moving forward here? Well, several roles. I mean, if one is a young, and we have many young uh, environmentally friendly businesses in, in the county, um, as, as Nigel referred to, many of those require the kind of business support, mentoring that any young uh, business does, uh, whatever sector they might be in. Uh, in this particular sector, we can continue to uh, introduce them uh, to some of the research and development facilities in our, in our universities here. We can promote them. Uh, and again, we've already seen some examples in, in the videos we've seen. So if, if they are, and we've now got many establishing themselves here because the uh, clusters like this are, are self-propelling. And so we can help them. If it's a business that hasn't yet begun to understand and adopt, adopt the technology, then again, it's part of our role is to help a, uh, maybe a, a business with a large factory understand how it could energy convert some of its energy consumption to to, to uses of energy, sources of energy, uh, and, and sources of heating and light, which are much more uh, environmentally friendly. And again, that's a different role, one we're playing an awful lot of in getting other businesses to understand the advantages of heat pumps, the, the reducing, ever reducing cost of PV, and to actually see this now as something which is really positive uh, for their own business, for their own staff, and for their own customers. Anything you'd like to add here, Nigel? Should, should the drive to net zero be viewed uh, as an extra hurdle to jump? I, I know some might think that way. Yeah, I think it, it's very easy to look at it through through the lens that says, you know, I've got to transform my business to you know, to net zero. What's that going to cost me? Actually, for many businesses, that journey has been how do I capitalise upon the new technologies and the capabilities to help improve the efficiency of the business? As Jeremy touched on, whether that's you know the overhead costs of, of running a business, but actually also to develop new technology and new capability, and, and that comes back full circle to skills development, training, workforce development. Um, so I think you know that there, there is a that there is a challenge uh, for all of us, whether that's in our homes or in our working lives, to look at climate change, to look at net zero, and, and see how we can do our our bit, if you like, uh, to contribute that. But I think what we're seeing is businesses identifying opportunities to move to new technologies, to look at how they can collaborate with others within their sector or across sectors to utilise and, uh, and take that capability forward, either as a business development opportunity themselves or as a business process improvement. Um, so if you, you know, if you look at a kind of connected system between uh, the use of energy in, in a business, its, uh, its data management systems, its ability to use that data more efficiently. So we, we're looking at things like quantum computing, which requires a, a, a different level of engineering capability that then processes data more efficiently that allows businesses to be more effective. And that goes from agri-tech for how we use our, our you know our land and, and and crop production right through to to health tech um and looking at the future of 
uh, how we manage an aging population and how do we keep them healthier for longer. Um, all that adds to our ability to, to manage efficiently resources and that can drive down our, uh, our impact on the climate, our use of resources. Um, and, and just think, you know, everything from the minute we get up in the morning to, to, to the point at which we go to bed on a night, how do we most efficiently uh, support uh, our lifestyles and in the case of our businesses, how we support them to transition through new energy systems, through new working practices. We're covering an incredible amount of ground here. Uh, I mean, oxygen just has so much going for it, doesn't it? I mean, the world-class visitor economy for one, Jeremy, that was one of the hardest hit sectors in the pandemic. How will Oxlip help that sector recover? Well, we, we'd had a very active uh, visitor tourism hospitality group for some time prior to to COVID, and 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 that group has has remained uh, in very close communication. And as we begin to see the opportunity for those businesses to be back out there, we've been as as active as other as as ever, uh, understanding their needs, supporting them, making the arguments to national government about where support is most needed, working from an international point of view to look at what uh, international events can return to Oxford and Oxfordshire just as soon as they can, encouraging. Uh, tour operators, as we've done in the past, to be regarding this as one of the must-see places within the UK for visitors coming here. And at the, at the very local level, as Nigel's referred to, if one is a small hospitality establishment, continuing to provide them all the support we possibly can do in terms of business support funding that's been made available. And uh, covering the, the whole gamut here, I mean, Nigel, how do you see the, the globally leading innovation ecosystem, the new transformative technologies, faring in 2022 and specifically what can Oxlep do to support them? Yeah again I think if you look at the breadth of those technologies uh, and, and we've touched them several times so if you look at space related technologies you look at uh, autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, our life sciences capability those are all areas that are underpinned by our academic excellence, they're, they're underpinned by significant commercial uh, research and development capability across companies that are developing as we've touched on whether it's vaccines or uh, or the next uh, kind of battery technology that, that can help us move or into a hydrogen or fusion technology uh, system so what we're doing is a, is a blend of, uh, of activity one is around ensuring that that capability is internationally recognized so we're working with the department for international trade through our internationalization plan work um, to really identify new markets, to promote that opportunity into market through national and international connections, through foreign and Commonwealth office connections into those new markets, building off the back of the trade deals as they start to, to, to move through the system. Um, and, and an example of which is working with the Australian government around uh, an Australian and UK space bridge. So looking at the space capabilities and technologies that also involved us talking to the Italian government who have ambitions around space technology development in their sector. Um, so we, we're already talking globally, we're already connecting globally and many of those businesses need investment. We've got uh, you know, a wealth of connections around capital growth investments, whether that's to grow the company initially or whether it's to scale it up at, at significant pace. Um, and we have companies, we touched on again, uh, around you know, solar technology, for instance, who are you know, developing that technology in Oxfordshire and manufacturing globally. And we're looking to maximise the capability of, of that investment within the UK as a global asset, but also recognising that sometimes those, those assets are uh, developed here, but, but produced elsewhere in the country. So levelling up in real time. How do we ensure that our capability around um, space and satellite sector, for instance, maximizes the opportunities in the southwest with the the uh, spaceport at Cornwall so that's you know a facility to uh, deploy satellites into space from a horizontal takeoff and landing perspective so you know you you take them up on on the back of a of a craft that then orbits um, and we deploy the satellites well that's a connection between Oxfordshire and, and and the southwest that enables business growth in both locations we grow the pie we grow the capability Oxfordshire businesses benefit from that and so do our communities who are accessing work and employment um, and again the fusion technology as an example 
working with the Sheffield City region on advanced manufacturing capability, which they have excellence in, and our fusion technology development here, where we can then test and develop some of the new processes that will support a new energy system around fusion. So real opportunities to collaborate, levelling up in real time, and taking that technology capability and innovation ecosystem to a global marketplace, underpinning it with strong research and development in, in Oxfordshire. Let's just stay on the, the collaboration points, uh, Jeremy, for a moment. Uh, would you agree that building even greater collaborations between business and academia and informing young people of the major opportunities that exist in Oxfordshire are key to the future success of the county as well as the UK? Yeah, very much so. And, and, and at whatever level of academic uh, attainment uh, one is trying to achieve. I mean, we, we clearly are fortunate here in having uh, internationally uh, world regarded uh, universities. But we've also got really, really strong FE colleges uh, providing uh, training, apprenticeships, uh, again, some of the areas we've already referred to. And it's the opportunity for youngsters to understand some of the new careers that they might be able to go in and equally to encourage employers to give those youngsters the opportunity. So we, we have an, a, an active apprenticeship program um, and, and, and with the, the new T-levels that are coming along. Uh, careers in, whether it's in, uh, as I was referred to, in agri-tech, uh, engineering, construction skills, where it's a different training, in many ways it's a much more exciting training uh, using equipment, using uh, AI, using uh, robotics, and getting youngsters to understand these will be the careers of the uh, the future. Um, and we are, happen to be in a really fortunate place uh, with young businesses, with research and de uh, research departments in our universities, in, in right on the front foot of some of these technologies as they emerge. And so bringing the two together is something that uh, is very important for us. Nigel, I know one of your mantras is collaboration is key, but do you, in your day-to-day, -day, come across innovative companies that, shall we say, can be reticent to work collaboratively? What would be your advice? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I, I think sometimes that, you know, you, you can have companies that are unsure about what collaboration really means. Is it is it giving up their IP? Is it giving up some control? Um, but actually what we found is that as soon as you start to identify common areas, you know, market focus, capability and technology development, sharing of skills and, and experience, then businesses very quickly see that as a, you know, as an added value aspect of their business journey. Um, so it's, it's important that we, you know, we develop the programs as we have done around things like the peer networks, which are, you know, create a safe place for people to talk about what they do, how they do it, and where those collaboration opportunities might exist. It's not the same as just kind of you know, speed dating by putting two people in a room. It's creating an environment where you can have a conversation because business is done by people. It's, it's done by communities and people who want to come together and do things. Yes, for a commercial return, absolutely. But, but they also have a focus on, on ensuring that that business is the best it can be. You take a company like Webmap, for instance, who are you know, have innovated beyond uh, just simply their day-to-day -day product to looking at how they can make a difference environmentally. You know, they've created an oxygen farm. Uh, they've invested significant investment in facilities off-site as well as facilities on-site to create collaborations with other businesses. And supply chain is the other bit that's critically important. We often forget that a business doesn't, doesn't operate as an island. Supply chains, technology within the sector, advice, research and development capability come together. And that's that's true collaboration. That's, you know, it's not just about working as, as two companies together. It's about having an invested, uh, agreed future plan. Um, and I think in many ways, we see businesses maturing through that. We see them taking on uh, new opportunities because their capability increases. Um, and we, we often see them looking at new markets because it gives them experience. You've got someone already trading in Latin America for the sake of argument. They've been through the pain of that business journey, both pre-COVID and post-COVID. And sharing that experience really does help. So there's a degree of, of uncertainty rather than perhaps reticence. Um, there's a need to give them the confidence to, to look at that collaboration as a positive business opportunity. Um, and I think, 
you know, in many ways, um, we're seeing our support across the business skills internationalization platform as part of the, uh, the connected tissue, making the connections, creating the safe place for the conversation and allowing the businesses to do what they're best at, do their day job, develop, innovate and create real value for Oxfordshire, for the UK and in a global market sense, um, many already do that. Jeremy, uh, you touched on the, the crucial role new talent plays in Oxfordshire's continued growth and development. Oxlep is certainly the champion of the apprentice. Uh, tell us about that commitment. Well, we, we have a team that uh, are all about um, trying to, as it were, both bring both ends into the middle um, to get employers to understand exactly what it is to take on apprenticeships, uh, to take on apprentices and to run the scheme and to get youngsters to, to see uh, and to bring them forward, to see the sort of opportunities that there are right on their doorstep. Um, there's, we've referred already to the Apprenticeship Awards. That's been something that's been actively participated in now for, for several years, um, where we simply bring forward some of the best employers uh, and highlight those. And in doing so, encourage others to, to then come forward and take up the opportunity themselves. It's a, it's a great way of uh, young people entering the workforce, gaining skills, uh, gaining a, a, the opportunity to actually work practically in the workforce to understand what all the employability skills are about, but at the same time, gain skills in a particular area that they can then take forward. And for an employers, it's a very, very good way of taking on young people, introducing them into the culture of their own organization and bringing them through and spotting talent very early on. You'll see, you'll hear many businesses talk uh, with with great positivity about how, it, how they've been able to bring young people through in, in their organisations and promote them year after year into senior positions. I know, Nigel, you're very proud of uh, the apprentices and the apprenticeships that uh, Oxlep help uh, garner. But uh, there is, this is the thing, getting the word out, isn't it? There's another way other than school onto university. I, I know from a, a previous presentation we've done together that your route into business was a was not the traditional one should we say yeah no absolutely um I, so i guess that, that there's two elements for me one is that there is still you know critically important that we support our young people from an early age to to want to to try things to to take risks to to fail sometimes and and, and kind of dust themselves off and, and move on because that's what happens in in a, in a business context not everything goes right every day but certainly from an apprenticeship, from a, you know, from a work experience perspective where we've had to, to, to pivot ourselves onto an online kind of virtual platform whilst, whilst the, the, the kind of world of COVID has impacted on face-to-face uh, -face work experience. Jeremy mentioned T levels an opportunity for employers to really engage with young people uh, and to allow them to understand the world of, uh, of, of a business marketplace. So, yeah, I mean, for me personally, school, you know, was was about sport, not necessarily about academia. Uh, and uh, and I spent 15 years at night school afterwards and did a, an apprenticeship <laughs> along the way. But um, I, I mean, the reality for me was, as a as a young person, I just didn't know what I wanted. I didn't have at the time the kind of infrastructure that we've put around uh, our young people. I didn't have a peer group that could interest me in apprenticeships at the time. You know, it was a, a university was never an option for me. Apprenticeship was what I fell into when I left school with no qualifications. Um, but but that was because I, I had an opportunity. Now we've got young people, apprentice ambassadors, going into the workplace, encouraging businesses to think about apprenticeships, to really advocate for the skills, the capability, and the energy and enthusiasm of our of our young people and. You know, we're blessed with that in many ways and, and we ignore it at our peril. And I think employers are recognising that. You'll see far more blended programmes of apprenticeship, graduates. Um, you'll see people coming in from school at, at, at an earlier stage of apprenticeship. You'll see them coming in at an advanced level um, and, and sometimes coming in, you know, 17, 16, 17 years old, going through an apprenticeship, going on to a degree course that's relevant to an industry and a sector that they've got a real interest and a passion for. And, you know, being that really valuable member of staff who's, who's invested several years going through an apprenticeship. And, you know, companies, we see them across Oxfordshire who have 
in a senior board, their management teams, their leadership teams have got apprentices that come through the company right the way through. Dark and Taylor is a perfect example of, you know, of a management team who have come through from an apprenticeship right the way through the company and are running it now and are absolute advocates through that apprenticeship awards uh, process, but also through supporting uh, our young people. So there, there are several routes. And I think what I would encourage is all young people and those looking to retrain actually, to just take advantage of the support that's available. You can go onto our website, you can see the support routes, we can, we can provide advice and guidance. Um, but really just try, because I didn't have a clue when I left school what I wanted to do. I went into forestry, I went into arboriculture, I ended up going through you know, landscaping, all sorts of things, and ended up managing programs and then managing companies and then managing you know, LEPs and various other things. And that route wasn't traditional in 15 years at night school along the way. For others, it's about taking that school experience into the workplace through work experience, demonstrating capability, perhaps then returning as an apprentice, and I know many do. And you know, their step then is into a business and into a career path, which we often forget. And, and that goes for everything from the legal profession through to catering, hospitality, front of house, and everything in between. You can go from the, you know, the classroom to the pit lane by, by going through an apprenticeship route, coming in as a graduate into that route, and then working through companies like you know, BMW or ProDrive and ending up on the pit lane at Williams. Um, and that's a real asset that, that not many parts of the country have. So real opportunity for me. The celebration of the incredible apprentices and their mentors is actually a genuine highlight in the Oxlep calendar with our annual Oxfordshire Apprenticeship Awards event. A chance to celebrate this incredible scheme, which is giving many hundreds of local young people a chance to be part of Oxfordshire's incredible story of economic and scientific success. Welcome to the Oxfordshire Apprenticeship Awards 2021. Well, how does that feel? You're a winner of first of tonight's awards. So how does that sound? That's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. Huge congratulations, Mia. How does it feel to be the Intermediate Apprentice of the Year? Absolutely amazing. Huge congratulations for winning this award. That's a fantastic achievement. Awards 2021 is our hashtag. So let's have a quick look at our social media awards. Get stars ready. We're pleased to announce not one, but two overall winners this year. So, so congratulations, congratulations to, to both Amelia and, and George as our overall winners. winners. Huge thank you to everyone at home for joining us tonight. We hope you had a lovely time and we hope to see you again next year. Bye bye. <laughs> the successful crop of apprentices uh, from, uh, from 2021 and nominations for next year's event are now open. Find out more at oxfordshirelep.com forward slash OA Awards 2022. You've been very busy posting questions for our panel of Jeremy Long and Nigel Tipple. Joining us right now is Rob Panting, who's Oxlep's communications manager, and he's been fielding your responses to this year's Oxlep annual events. And we'll pose some questions to Jeremy and Nigel right now. Rob, over to you. Thank you, Howard, uh, and thanks everyone. Uh, very busy on the uh, on the chat bar, so thank you to, to everyone for their contribution so far. Um, lots of varied questions, I'm pleased to say. So we'll try and cover off as uh, as many of those as possible. Um, the, the first one, I think, reflects back on, on some of the work that we've done earlier in the year around the, the Oxfordshire Plan 2050 uh, and ensuring that business engagement continues, not just around Oxfordshire Plan 2050, but I think the future uh, economic um, uh, growth of the county and plans for the county. So th there's, there's been a couple of questions uh, focused around that and how will Oxep help to ensure that the business the business voice continues to be heard as future plans for our county uh, evolve? Um, Nigel, shall I start with you, and then we'll uh, we'll yeah. head across to, to Jeremy. 
Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, we, we've taken a proactive approach for many years now in, in ensuring that we advocate for and, and get real business engagement into many of those statutory consultation processes. And the plan 2051 is probably in, in the last 10 years is the most significant opportunity really to help shape um, the future place that those businesses will operate within and the, and the future uh, communities that, that will support those businesses with workforce. So, you know, for us, um, ensuring that we work as part of a whole system, as an Oxfordshire whole system process, um, I meet regularly with the local authority chief execs, um, actually on a weekly basis, and have done over the last two years, really, to, to make sure that we're getting visibility of some of the challenges that businesses are facing. So if you think about the COVID pandemic, um, immediate response from government with a variety of funding uh, response packages, but businesses needed to be able to navigate those. And the feedback that we got through our growth hub um, of the challenges that those businesses were facing, accessing those grants, accessing some of the financial support that was available, was really important to help inform the business department in government about what was working on the ground. Um, and we had regular weekly through our growth hub, through Helen and the team, feeding that back into government, providing real time narrative back into government to ensure that they were aware of what some of the challenges were for business. And again, if you if you fast forward to, to the most recent consultation engagement around plan 2050, then that was about making sure there was a balance in that plan, recognizing that for businesses to continue to meet uh, their growth aspirations, that we need the right balance of infrastructure, the right balance of utility provision in order to support that business journey. But we've seen significant investment into our business parks, into our science parks, um, into uh, locations like Harwell and Cullum and Begbrook and you know the the, the Oxford um, uh, Business Park and Science Park, where major international investments coming in. That's about ensuring our businesses can help inform what they need to be able to continue to grow and to create the opportunities for both our existing communities and our future ones. Um, uh, so yeah, um, lots of opportunity that we see for businesses to continue to engage. We've created the fora within which those businesses can engage through our board, through our subgroups. We can help shape the strategy that evolves from that, whether that's economic, whether that's response uh, around visitor economy and a lot of work going on on that at the minute with visitor economy businesses at the heart um, and significantly our businesses who are looking to grow and develop on you know, existing and future sites. So getting that balance between places to, to work, places to live and the quality of the environment that, that we all cherish um, is something that business can continue to play an active part in through that consultation process. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, Jeremy, anything further to add? I mean, I think, I think one has to realise that um, for the prosperity of any region, indeed any nation, uh, ultimately it's about continuing to provide employment, prosperity at, at the local level. And, and we're, we're fortunate here in Oxford and Oxfordshire having had high levels of employment and as we've touched on many different areas where one can find employment and careers here. But as technology changes, as, as industry's aspirations for space and facilities change, it's vital uh, that those ideas, those plans are put into the mix of, of what will continue to uh, sustain a very viable, um, very vibrant uh, local economy. And so the kind of voices, and there are many voices at any point in time as to what should contribute to a 10, 20, 30 year outlook for any community. Um, but it is essential that businesses can say, this is how we see our businesses evolving. These are the kind of technologies. This is where we see employment, our requirements. And that is put into the mix in terms of planning, planning the region. Uh, and and I, I don't think we've, we've ever been in a period of time in, in history where we're seeing technologies change as fast. And therefore, to keep up with that and to see what that might mean in terms of changes of pattern of employment and equally to continue to attract talent here. The more that we promote the opportunities 
the more that we will continue to draw international talent, individuals and businesses to come and put their own footprint down here and to make it their base. And we have many, many stories of that. But the more that we are able to talk about what is here already, the lifestyle that one can have here and the opportunities there are to rub shoulders uh, with other businesses in a similar sector or to gain the benefits from our academic institutions. That's also part of contributing to the long-term prosperity of the region. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I think you both touched a little bit on the, the, the next question, which refers to some of the transformative technologies that exist in the county. And, and this, um, uh, our colleague on the call, has referenced the, the recent news around the Connected Autonomous Vehicle trial at, at the Harwell campus, which um, I'm sure many of you have seen on the on the news recently. Um, do we believe that um, we should be excited by these new technologies coming into the county? And, I, and a couple of others have commented on what this means for our communities. Uh, Jeremy, you just, just touched on the opportunities for young people. Nigel, you spoke about business collaboration too, and how these new technologies can be rolled out in Oxfordshire. Um, mm. How exciting is that? Uh, for us as a not only as a LEP I suppose but also as a as a county um, Nigel if I start with you yeah absolutely uh, so yeah I mean the the, the Howell trial um, of fully autonomous uh, bus pod um, it, it's uh, it's quite interesting to watch it you, you watch it pull up at a bus stop there's no driver there you've got uh, you know the door opens and uh, and in you go and, and you know you you've got that that kind of sense of uh, of excitement because it's something new, it's something different, um, and then you've got that little bit of uncertainty when it starts to move away because you're not in control anymore and something else is, and there isn't a driver at the front. Um, but the reality is, I think you know, if you look at any technology, we settle into it so so easily as as a nation. Actually, um, it, it's not that long ago for, for many of us that mobile phones came in a case and you plugged it into your cigarette lighter in a car. Um, and you had to pull over onto the hard shoulder to, you know, to make a call. Um, and we now have voice activated uh, act, you know, uh, phone systems. We do all our banking online. So that technology evolution becomes something that's, uh, that's embraced uh, and becomes part of that. I think uh, particularly around that autonomous vehicle work, we have had for many years capability around fully autonomous vehicles. Um, and we've seen them running around the streets of, uh, of Oxfordshire, particularly around uh, the, the, the kind of um, Summertown and Headington areas where Oxbotica were running trials of fully autonomous cars. Now, um, a little bit disconcerting if that car pulls up at the side of you at set of traffic lights and there's no driver in it. So there was someone sat in the driving seat. Um, but, you know, you can go online and see those, those vehicles driving around Oxfordshire navigating Oxfordshire streets, back streets, main roads, roundabouts, yeah, everything. And we've replicated that with investment at Cullum in pilot schemes around what we refer to as pit lane, which is a, a facility that looks very much like a Formula One pit lane uh, that you'd see at Silverstone, but it's there to, to create um, a cap capability to bring those autonomous vehicles in, to, uh, to pack them up, to plug them into the, the computer system, to download the data, to learn from that, and that suddenly creates new employment opportunities. It's not just about the technology in the car, which is using sensors and, and video and, and a whole range of technology learning how to, uh, to, uh, to navigate our streets or navigate, in this case, how well. But it also creates capability around data management that links to our ability to use satellites, to use the future of quantum computing and its larger data capacity. So, Real opportunities, real things happening in our, you know, in our streets, in our, our business parks. In the case of, of Harwell, and I think it does create opportunity. You know, there will be places where those autonomous vehicles can add real value. We jump on, uh, you know, on a train uh, with a driver a long way in front of us, and, and don't think about that. You know, it, it, the, the possibilities around creating more efficient ways of, of moving our, our, our people, goods and services around using autonomous uh, vehicles, drones, a variety of things, I think will become um, second nature to us in time. Um, but it is about our future and it is about embracing it uh, and not seeing it as, as negative, but as an opportunity to learn. Uh, and, and the Howell one is a key example. Relatively safe environment, 
live running uh, in, in the sense of we've got people and roads and junctions, roundabouts and level crossings. Uh, and you know, we can we can now that technology to develop for our future benefit. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, Jeremy, maybe um, perhaps a comment on the uh, how excited our communities should be uh, around these technologies existing in in Oxfordshire and, and not just existing in Oxfordshire. These are you know, the best technologies in the world being developed here and, and what it means perhaps for our communities to, to really um, um, benefit from them and, and show a real interest in them too. Well, I think it, it, it's probably fair to say in many cases, uh, our local communities aren't aware of many of the new technologies that are being developed down the road um, from them. And I'm not surprised by that. I think when I first uh, came to be involved in in Oxlap and, and and took on the chair, it was it was something of a realization for me as to just how many uh, sources, centres of excellence that we we have here in the county. So uh, part of the role is to try and demonstrate whether it, whether as it were one's talking to parents, grandparents, or to children, if you like, in terms of generations, whether it's helping them to be consumers and users of new technology or absolutely where, as, as we've been talking about this morning, where it's about talking to, uh, to younger people um, who will look to the careers of the future in some of these areas. And, and that pace of change, as I've said, is, is very dramatic. Uh, the kind of 10 year half-life of some of the changes of these technologies is very substantial. So there is very much a role, for, and the universities recognize that here uh, themselves as well, with the number of open days, the number of showcases, that they are very happy to provide to try and encourage everyone locally to come and see exactly what's uh, what's going on and to open up their own research and development facilities we're very very fortunate but we must go on making sure that there is that right level of awareness uh, because this is what will continue to drive the prosperity of the region and thankfully will be part of driving the prosperity of the nation and we can benefit other regions i mean uh, as Nigel referred to a few minutes ago now we can help other regions to benefit off the back of some of the things that are happening here and in turn therefore make them more prosperous in, the, in, in their own terms. Thanks Jeremy, that, that actually leads very nicely into our next question. We've, we've had a couple of questions with regards to the Oxford Cambridge Arc and, and the role that the Arc will play uh, moving forward particularly around um, uh, attracting investment into not only Oxfordshire but I guess the the wider region um, the ability to connect um, uh, whether it's investment or organizations from further afield with our excellent science innovation uh, led economy um, maybe just uh, briefly uh, a response to the role that the art can play moving forward uh, Nigel again we'll start with you and, and then we'll go on to Jeremy yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I, I think there are two key areas. One is the point we've been stressing all day, which is around collaboration. It creates opportunities for businesses to work together, for us to work together with other uh, geographies, whether that's LEPs or local authorities, to promote the capability, um, not just the sectoral expertise, but the cross-sector capability that we have. Um, and back in 2019, uh, I was involved in uh, very early stages then promoting the potential of the ARC and some of the common areas of interest, whether that was autonomous vehicles, we've just touched on, space and satellite. We've got Harwell with the, the largest concentration of space related companies in Europe, uh, but we've also got Westcott across the border in Buckinghamshire um, that has some of the world leading propulsion systems. Now, we don't need to replicate those capabilities. What we need to do is work together to make sure that the journey for business is something that's seamless and that we create international opportunities for those businesses. And to that end, we are developing jointly with the partners across the arc uh, currently an internationalization plan that will look to showcase capability around sector. Um, so key sectors, key investments, future of, uh, of aviation, um, you know, carbonless flight, jet zero, um, areas around energy, energy technology, life sciences, a range of different opportunities that we'll promote together, but we will land in place. The, you know, the investments will land in communities, in places within that geography, and we will play our part in both promoting capability, 
we're also in landing investment into Oxfordshire for the benefit of uh, not just the, 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 the kind of local economy, but the UK economy as well. So real opportunities, as I see it, to collaborate, to work in partnership and to get some real significant scale and added value uh, to build on the kind of legacy that, uh, that Jeremy's referred to. Uh, Jeremy, anything further to add with regards to the ARC? I know, again, you work very closely with Nigel on, on developments there. I, mean, I think the ARC is, a, it, it is about getting the most out of the region, um, the region that is defined as the, as, as the region between Oxford and, and Cambridge, although clearly you know, one can go on to the west or to the east and talk about a, an even wider region. It's about getting everyone to understand its potential, it, it, it is an area that already has huge uh, natural capital. It's one where there is now an enormous focus on taking that forward in terms of improving the green environment. But it's also one of uh, where one can see uh, businesses beginning to put themselves down in places that they may not have been aware of across the arc, but yet still provide good transport connections, not just in the out of London, which is the way it was traditionally seen, but uh, east, west, west, east. And so, the arc is about making the very best of what we already have and over time and making it into an even more successful region, working with the local authorities who clearly have the right to plan it on a local basis, but encouraging businesses to look at it in the widest context and perhaps not uh, always to try and cluster around currently the areas of the most intensive industrial activity. Excellent, thank you, Jeremy. I, I'm acutely aware of uh, of time. Um, we've been inundated with with, with questions. Um, genuinely, we have. So um, we're probably not going to be able to get through all of those. However, we we do have everyone's details, and we'll ensure that we that we follow up directly with you. A, a lot of questions around how our business support is going to uh, to evolve in the coming year, supporting scale up businesses, uh, supporting businesses to be more more innovative. Um, we'll certainly get in touch with you individually and ensure that you're signposted to the to the right support moving forward. But um, thank you to, to everyone for, for sending your questions across and, um, and we're very, uh, very grateful. Howard, back over to you. Many thanks to Rob Panting, Oxleps Communications Manager, with a host of your questions and points from today's discussion. And uh, as Rob alluded to, we'll get back in touch with you uh, to try and answer the points that you've raised. Uh, so we were obviously inundated with a number of questions today, which is uh, great. And thank you for tuning in. Similarly, if you're watching this as a recording and you want to get in touch, please go to oxygelep.com and contact the team. As we heard from Jeremy and Nigel earlier, many of the answers to the global issue of reducing the impacts of climate change are being developed right here in Oxfordshire. Numerous organisations have potential solutions to the challenge all of us face in getting to net zero, but need the ability to scale up and to finance their companies and be able to make a difference. Recently, Oxlet hosted an official COP26 event from the University of Oxford. The aspiration of the event was to showcase Oxfordshire's potential to be able to take a billion tonnes of CO2 out of mankind's impact on the environment and how Oxfordshire leads the global charge to address the climate emergency. Carbon emission reduction is one of the most critical challenges we face. Oxford is the, a world leader in, in innovation. And I think there's a great opportunity, and we're seeing it already, for Oxford to be at the forefront, to really make a difference, to, to, to address those global challenges. We have to get this right. We have to get this right for now and for the future, for the children of tomorrow, who are going to be the ones living on this planet, but also creating the new solutions to the world's greatest challenges. I'd really love to see a world where we focus more on the greener resources. It's really important for our future because if once you get past the tipping point, there's no going back. By attracting the right investment, collaboration and interest in our innovation ecosystem, we believe that in the future, Oxfordshire's strength can collectively deliver a billion tonne drop in global carbon emissions. This is Springfield Meadows. It's the greenest project we've done so far and I think it's the greenest project in the country. 
So the target here is to have zero embodied carbon at the construction stage. We use bio-based materials to lock up carbon. So that's things like timber, hemp and wood fibre because they've all grown. They're all plants originally and they absorb carbon dioxide as they grow. We then lock that up into the buildings and that helps to offset the carbon emitted from things like concrete and glass and steel. The automotive industry is going through a revolution, but back in 2005 I had a, a very simple question. Why are there no electric cars? And um, I did a PhD at Oxford University and that led to the spin-off of Yasa Motors in 2009 and we've been working and perfecting this motor technology for the last 12 years. We need to find ways of getting energy into the households, into the industry, into the country. A very good cell today can maybe absorb 22% of the solar spectrum and convert it into uh, electricity. Now, if you can increase that percentage, and that's what we do, then of course, with lower space, you can generate the same amount of electricity. All organic matter emits methane as it decays, and if we don't capture it, it's 86 times more damaging to the planet than CO2. We're focused on dairy farms, um, and we also focus on small-scale farming. So that means any dairy farmer with 75 cows or upwards, they can deploy this technology and use that captured methane to power the farm, to power tractors, excess can be sold off into transport to power heavy goods vehicles. So it's that complete, closed-loop circular economy. QDOT was a spin-out from the University of Oxford, spin out with a mission of trying to enable clean flight. At the moment, planes use a lot of power during takeoff, but actually quite a small amount of power during cruise. But you can size the engine to be as really efficient at cruise, and then you can use something like battery power to supplement the power during takeoff. And that can save you up to about 25% in fuel consumption. Fusion energy can be a safe and sustainable part of the world's future low carbon energy mix. It's got lots of attributes that make it really exciting as a low carbon energy source. It's abundant, lots of energy is released from that. At Cullum, we've got two major fusion experiments. We've got the joint European Taurus, which has been running here and leading the world in fusion research for several decades. We've got the MAST experiment, that's the UK's national experimental facility in fusion. So, Ultimately, we're all trying to produce fusion power plants, power stations using fusion that will keep the lights on, power our homes, power our factories. We're doing the research that will lead to that. If we were to build every house in the country in this way, that's lots of insulation, very airtight, and then we put lots of solar panels on the roof. That means you can generate as much energy each year as the houses use to get to net zero energy. There's three million houses planned over the next 10 years by the government and that would save 600 million tonnes of CO2 emissions. So it is pretty significant. Obviously we are delighted to be part of the Mercedes family now. Each electric car takes a significant amount of CO2 off the road. This adds up into uh, tens of millions of tonnes of CO2 over, over the life of the vehicle. So these are really significant um, environmental impacts. A 150 cow dairy farm can reduce carbon by 2,800 tonnes a year, and that's one 150 cow dairy farm. Head of COP, the 26 countries are committing to cutting methane emissions by 30%, and to be a part of that, to be at the forefront of that, so yeah, the future is incredibly exciting. QDOT's based on the Harwell campus in South Oxfordshire, in the energy cluster. It's just a really exciting place to, to be with people and to collaborate with really intelligent, really excited people in the kind of science and technology field. This technology will be one of the most important technologies for solar, so it will be applied worldwide, right? and we can say it has its roots in Oxfordshire. Oxfordshire has a great history of developing pioneering solutions. This is about dealing with the issues now that gives the, a future to our young people, to, to our grandchildren. Change is something we all need to embrace and to make the world a brighter one for our generation and for generations after us. Oxford is in such a great, strong place to lead the charge, really, to reduce carbon emissions with the research capabilities, the ability to innovate and be creative about um, addressing these challenges that we face.
Inspiring stuff indeed. Let me just once again say a huge thank you to our panel for their excellent contributions to the Oxlep annual event. The chair of Oxlep, Jeremy Long, and the chief executive, Nigel Tipple. Thank you all for watching and contributing to the discussion too. It's really much appreciated. Oxlep's role has never been more important. Oxygen has a business community that benefits from an entrepreneurial can-do attitude but like all business communities right now, it needs support across many guises and in many areas. With the established relationships across the private and public sector, Oxlip is perfectly placed and positioned to provide that response in 2022 and beyond. <clears throat> Hopefully today's annual event has inspired you to get in touch and let Oxlip help your organization in the months ahead. Head to the website, oxfordshirelep.com. As promised, I won't make any predictions about next year, but I can wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a happy, prosperous and healthy new year. And that's about it from me, Howard Bentham. Thanks very much for being part of Oxlip's annual event 2021. Stay safe and goodbye for now. <laughs>